What's up, guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Nara and Uzumaki? Part 11. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. Because Like the overwhelming majority of the Hyuga, I specialize in Taijutsu and clan-specific Jutsu. I'm also proficient with throwing weapons and Katan, but I prefer close-range combat. The Jonin replied after a moment's thought. Therefore, in the event of an unavoidable clash, we will use formations for two close combat fighters with support. Nodding, I shifted back and resumed my position in the diamond formation. I hadn't heard anything surprising, but it was necessary to verify. The standard tactic for a team of four with two Taijutsu users and a Nara is to hold back the most powerful enemies, allowing them to be caught in the shadows, while the fourth team member handles long-range units and holds them for the time needed to eliminate stationary targets. Of course, variations are possible depending on the strength and specialization of the enemy team, but given that we are likely to encounter mostly Chunin and a rare Jonin as the leader, this scheme works almost always. We then quickened our pace, and there was no time for idle chatter. There were still a few days journey ahead, so we had plenty of time to talk. For the first couple of days, we traveled almost without encountering any obstacles. Enemy patrols near the border had long since disappeared, and the few rare sabotage teams we encountered were easily detected and avoided at a great distance by our leaders Byakugan. It was only on the second day that we had to fight a team of Chunin, one of whom was a skilled sensor who managed to detect us and lead his comrades to such weak chakra sources. However, against the level of two Jonin and two strong Chunin, they had nothing to counter, and the trio of IWA Shinobi was defeated in literally a few seconds. I didn't even need to reveal the chakra source, as I already outpaced all three of the young men by speed. What were they even hoping for? Although, they might have thought they were pursuing Jenin led by a weak Chunin, as our team felt at the moment. Watching as the Hyuga dispatched his opponents with just two touches led me to an interesting but somewhat disheartening realization. Despite not having as many field experiences as my teammates, I had worked with many shinobi, both clan-based and non-clan. I observed the taijutsu each shinobi employed. The conclusion was rather grim, only certain clans, whose abilities integrate well with taijutsu, like the Inazuka, Uchiha, and Hyuga, have a reasonably decent base in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Others only have a basic setup designed to not die in the next few seconds and create distance for using jutsu or throwing sharp slash explosive items. That's it. I'm not even mentioning the primitive techniques taught at the academy or various styles that only work with superior opponent strength and speed. Go Ken, for instance, is so simple and primitive in its essence that its straightforward and basic strikes can be predicted by almost anyone. What's different is that managing to stop or counter them still requires effort. In general, other styles available aren't any better, and clan-specific variations consider the unique abilities of their users, but don't suit everyone else. The only exception might be the Senju, but even they need to have great endurance to use the Thousand Hands style. If all clans and masters of hand-to-hand -hand combat came together to develop a single, well-thought-out Taijutsu style suitable for most shinobi, it would provide a significant advantage for our forces compared to the fragmented situation in other hidden villages. After all, I once saw a demonstration of hand-to-hand -hand combat by special forces trained specifically for killing or instant neutralization of opponents, and it looked far superior in technique compared to everything demonstrated by fighters in this world. And if you add the ability to use chakra to that, it's best not to get close to such a monster. Uh, and why am I not a former special forces operative? It's all because of these damned local secrecy and suspicion, ingrained from the cradle. Masters would rather take their knowledge to the grave than let it be revealed to a broader audience unrelated to them. Of course, it's clear that sooner or later the knowledge will fall into enemy hands. But what's the point of the arms race then? The world of Shinobi has virtually halted in its development, despite the fact that the saying war is the engine of progress is true for all worlds. 
Unfortunately, progress turns into regression when the bearers of knowledge do not share it and prefer to take it to their graves. Damn, most of the numerous problems in this world have one common cause. And there's nothing to be done about it. The locals' mentality is just that way. Sure, you can set an example, but people will milk you dry, thank you, and then, just to be on the safe side, they'll squash you to prevent you from sharing with enemies as well. After burying the still warm corpses with Dotan and cleaning up all traces of the encounter, we moved on, periodically checking the map as we approached the borders of the land of Earth's residential areas. That such a kid is surely not foolish enough to leave them completely unguarded. Even during a losing war, there are similar alert points scattered across the country for us in case of saboteurs. By unanimous decision, it was decided to bypass the dangerous area from the side of Hankai, the less populated of the two cities. After a brief consultation over a map drawn on the ground, we decided to rest in a safer place first and then continue our journey around 3 in the morning, taking advantage of the less detectable time of day. According to our rough calculations, we should aim to reach the most convenient gorge by dawn and proceed along its floor, without fearing visual detection by enemy forces. The land of Earth has so many canyons, gorges, and mountains that tracking even a tenth of them is impossible, even for several great villages, let alone Iwagakure no Sato which has greatly reduced in numbers during recent years of war. Although some Dotan users can track enemies by soil vibrations, even the best shinobi can only detect enemies within a 5km radius, unlike the Byakugan, which has a much greater range. The Byakugan can detect foreign chakra much earlier than we can be discovered, and it also served as a suitable shelter for the night. The small cave we discovered, which could comfortably accommodate twice as many people, came in handy. After ensuring it had not been previously used by anyone, we prepared for a brief rest and took the opportunity to have a proper meal instead of choking down ration bars on the move. Although it was just rice porridge with dried meat, even such food seemed incredibly delicious compared to the alternative. With at least four hours left until nightfall, judging by the overcast sky, Hizashi decided to use my sensory seals and chakra concealing barrier to allow the entire team to rest before the difficult passage, rather than having a rotating watch. Strictly speaking, the chance of being detected was already very slim, and with the use of Fuinjutsu it became virtually zero so we accepted this rule violation during rest in hostile territory with understanding. While my teammates were settling down on the rolled out futons, I took the opportunity to remove the blocking seal allowing chakra to flow again into the nearly depleted Kirikuki eye after two days. The barrier can conceal even Jinchuriki's emissions, provided they don't use techniques inside, so even the most sensitive sensors won't detect me. But it's definitely worth replenishing chakra reserves for tomorrow. One's physical strength alone is definitely not enough to navigate sheer cliffs. We moved on late at night, when even the rare animals inhabiting the barren land of Tsuchi no kuni preferred to sleep in their burrows. Presumably, the same goes for most enemy shinobi, so the risk of detection is significantly reduced. Of course, making our way through rocky terrain in almost complete darkness, with the moon and stars completely hidden by the cloudy sky, is not as great as it might seem from the outside, but providing a substantial amount of chakra to our eyes allows us to see at least a little. The only downside is that my teammates' eyes appear as two bottomless voids in the darkness. Except for Hizashi. His eyes glow in the dark like two faint lanterns due to the excess chakra. It looks pretty cool. Having managed to reach the marked gorge after a bit more time than calculated, try finding your way when you can only distinguish the contours of the surroundings. And with some injuries to our feet from unnoticed boulders underfoot, we gratefully stopped for a short rest and to wait for dawn. Trying to reach the bottom of the gorge in complete darkness would be the act of a suicide or fool, considering the nearly vertical walls. One wrong move and you could easily fall down. The bottom is at least 30 meters below and no one has prepared a soft landing pad. Indicating for us to follow his lead, Hizashi approached the edge of the gorge and began to descend the sheer wall calmly, clinging to it with his hands and feet, thus using three points of contact at any moment and not even attempting to look cool by trying to walk down as a novice might. Following his example, I quickly saw the wisdom of this approach. The rock of the gorge was sandy and crumbled quite easily, so it could have detached from the main mass under the weight of a shinobi and sent overly confident individuals down much faster than desired. Damn, it's clear that Hizashi has spent many years fighting in such terrain. Despite the crawling movement, 
We reached the bottom quite quickly and then proceeded almost like on a gravel road. The sandstone breaks into pieces upon falling, forming a rather convenient strip of gravel at the bottom of the gorge, allowing us to walk without fear of injuring our feet. The stupid open-toed sandals so popular with Shinobi in Kanoha are obviously unsuitable for such terrain. The thin layer of chakra around the feet helps, but not when every drop of chakra needs to be conserved and we have to avoid enemy shinobi. That's why we sometimes had to stop and tend to our teammates' scratched toes. Such scrapes heal quickly even for ordinary people, but we had to be careful about the scent as well, since even some shinobi can smell blood from a considerable distance, not to mention various trained animals or summons. Rising from my knees and brushing off Rotaro's grateful nod, I promised myself that as soon as I encountered a suitable Awagakure shinobi with proper boots and the right size, I would definitely change my shoes to avoid further discomfort. The constant presence of sand and pebbles in my shoes is really unpleasant. After about three hours of slow progress, we finally passed the relatively dangerous section of the gorge. After another scan of the surrounding area with Byakugan, we were able to use chakra to accelerate without risking injuring our feet or leaving an even more noticeable trail. Even on rugged terrain, the average shinobi can reach speeds of about 50 kilometers per hour, so it was no surprise that we covered the remaining distance and dove into the next gorge within half an hour. It took us another half hour to run to the mountainous terrain, and once we crossed that we would be almost at our destination. However, just as the weather decided to give us trouble, the previously overcast sky began to drizzle slowly but steadily, quickly turning into a heavy downpour. While my cloak offered some protection from the moisture, reduced visibility and the danger of slipping on wet rocks forced us to exercise more caution. By the time the team reached the foothills, everyone, including the dog, was soaked to the bone and not in the best of spirits. During a brief rest before the final ascent, everyone silently ate their rations, and I raised a pertinent question. Shouldn't we wait out the rain? Climbing in this weather, we might end up dead. We don't have time. The sky is completely overcast, so waiting for a few hours for improvement doesn't make sense. Hizashi shook his head. We could end up waiting all night with no sign of improvement, and crossing the mountainous terrain in such weather and darkness would be even worse. We should go now. Shrugging. I finished my ration bar and, following the others, got to my feet, stowing the trash in one of the many pockets of my pants. In principle, it's not that easy for a shinobi to die and anything else I can either heal or, at worst, seal in a scroll. In that case, I'll unlock the chakra. I informed the team leader. Right now, this wall of water makes detection difficult even within hundreds of meters, let alone kilometers. Hizashi nodded, wiping the droplets of moisture from his face. At least I can now securely attach chakra to the rock without fear of detection. Sum grumbled and her dog barked in agreement. Yes, Karamaru, you can let loose now. Sighing with relief and feeling the suppressed chakra returning to my Kirakuki eye, washing away the accumulated fatigue and bringing back the desire to act, I struggled to suppress the impulse to create something amusing or crazy. After all, having too much energy really affects even Anara's mindset, let alone everyone else. From my own experience, I know that critical perception tends to drop significantly in such situations, while the sense of false omnipotence and invulnerability often leads to underestimating opponents with predictable results. The greater the yang component in the chakra, the stronger this effect seems to be. There's a reason why Jinchuriki tend to lose their minds during battles when using their host powers. Bijou have a very strong life force. After a few minutes of calming down and regaining control over my impulses, I concealed my chakra as much as possible and nodded to the waiting Hizashi. We then quickly ran up the slope, occasionally avoiding patches of grass and scraggly bushes that somehow managed to grow in such harsh terrain. Sandal prints don't leave marks on rocks, especially in the rain. Anyone who has ever been on a mountaineering expedition knows how dangerous it is to traverse steep slopes in bad weather, even with reliable safety equipment. Climbing up sheer rock faces without safety gear in continuous rain and on wet, slippery stones is even more dangerous, even if you're a shinobi who can literally stick to any surface. After a few crashes against unseen protrusions following jumps, I had to seal Karamaru, who clearly wasn't suited for such acrobatics despite all his training and chakra. How do shinobi even move through mountains? 
mostly by running and jumping, actually. You hop across ledges where possible, run up nearly vertical or inclined surfaces, and leap frog style to the next one. If desired, a Jounin can reach speeds of up to 100 kilometers per hour, which an ordinary person could never achieve. The same goes for long jumps. 30 meters? No problem. You crouch on a stable surface, channel more chakra into your legs, and push off strongly. That's it. You fly through the air like you're fired from a cannon, even nearly horizontally. The only problem is landing without smashing your face into a targeted rock. I strongly suspect that such scenes closely resemble comic books and superhero cartoons. When someone is thrown into a wall, and instead of becoming a smear, they land on their feet and shoot back at the enemy from a horizontal position. It's exactly like that. I'm almost certain that the stone after such launches develops a pretty decent network of cracks. However, there's one minor drawback to all this movement shinobi can't fly. Well, not all shinobi can fly and unfortunately, the ability to fly is not one of our squad's strengths. Given that after just 15 meters upward among the boulders, strong gusts of wind start to pick up, and a long jump might end up nowhere near where you intended, it's very easy to crash onto sharp rocks below. Being able to fly would be extremely useful. I'm okay. I can extend an arm and release a chain with a pointed end from my tenketsu if I notice I'm deviating, which digs into the rock and supports even my weight. However, I had to catch my teammates several times using the same method, of course, wrapping them up rather than hooking them, to prevent them from missing the intended spot. And the worst part is, there's nothing you can do if you go down, you'll end up taking three to four times longer to get back up, and you can't jump from peak to peak because they are too far apart. Sure, 30 meter cliffs aren't enormous, but that's at least a 14 story building, so jumping at such a great height is quite scary. Not to mention the mental and physical strain. After three hours of this, I started feeling fatigued and was soaked like a dog. Not to mention my teammates who didn't have the same physical strength and endurance. However, just when I thought Rotaro might fall on his next jump, a gap appeared ahead. Through the curtain of drizzling rain and the dim light of the encroaching evening, we saw a mountain slope and the blurred outlines of cultivated fields at the edge of our vision. Activating his dojitsu, Hizashi confirmed that we had reached the opposite side and were almost in the inhabited lands of Tsuchi no Kuni. Finally, I thought those damned rocks would never end. Sum grumbled, breathing heavily. Rotaro said nothing but nodded in agreement. Our commander, though looking better than this pair, was also breathing heavily and had depleted his chakra by a quarter, despite his refined control. Since in an hour this weather will make visibility zero, we're stopping to rest and we'll move on tomorrow morning, said the Jounin, looking at the sky and starting to scan the surroundings with Byakugan. Rio san there's a decent fissure nearby, but it's too narrow for the three of us. Can you widen it and seal the entrance? As the only shinobi in the team capable of manipulating Dotan in the terrain, albeit without proper inclination or training, it fell to me to prepare a shelter in the absence of natural cover nearby. How high is it? About two meters high and one and a half meters wide. No more, clarified Huga. And the depth? One meter, it looks like a crack formed and a piece fell out, creating the gap. All right, I can expand it into a small cave, but I wouldn't expect more than that. I shrugged. Any kind of shelter will do to avoid sleeping in a puddle, hide from the rain, and dry off a bit, grumbled Inazuka. The location Hizashi found was not far away, just 300 meters from the ledge where we had stopped. So within a minute, I squatted down and, placing my palms on the wet rock at the top of the crack, evenly infused it with my chakra, which transformed into doton on the surface. Slowly and carefully, I expanded the crack in both depth and width, moving excess stone up and down, sealing cracks, and creating a reasonably normal cubic cave of three by four meters with relatively smooth floors and walls. It took about 20 minutes to create a decent sleeping area. Of course, it wasn't like creating giant holes in the ground or erecting mountains designed to crush the enemy, like skilled Dotan users can, but it was still pretty good. Here you go, I said as I got up from my knees, wiping my wet hands on my cloak, but to no avail. Giving up on the futile effort, I followed the others into the cave, rummaged through my pockets, and slapped three seals on the walls. Two on either side of the entrance and one on the side wall. I then nearly completely closed the opening with an earthen barrier, 
leaving only a narrow gap for air. A portable chakra lamp on paper would prevent us from being left in the dark, and the barriers would prevent sensitive sensors from detecting us due to chakra usage, as soon as the rain stopped. While I was finishing up the shelter, my teammates were already stripping off their soaking wet clothes, ignoring modesty, and changing into clean, dry clothes taken from the travel scrolls along with the futons. With a grunt, I focused on the water in the clothes, infusing it with chakra, then simply gathered it into a small ball with my fist and poured it out. The advantage of Swayton Affinity in full display. Throwing my cloak in a corner, I too got out and spread my bedding, then started on dinner. Unfortunately, it was still the same dry rations. What's our plan? The terrain here is quite flat, and the chances of getting through unnoticed during the day are lower than I'd like. I asked Hugo. We rest until about 3 or 4 in the morning, and if there's no more rain, we head out, replied the Jounin. There's only a few hours of running left to the courier's route, so we should make it by dawn and set up a proper hideout. Nodding, I finished the last of my ration and drank from my flask. Ishi, you're on first watch, Nara second. The commander began to list, but I interrupted him. I'll leave a clone on watch, as it's better for everyone to get a good rest and be prepared for anything tomorrow. After a moment's hesitation, Hizashi nodded. Fine then. Barely touching my head to the pillow, I fell into a deep sleep, only to be jolted awake by a poke from a Kage Bunshin. It dispersed, and I received memories of the watch in the dark. But that wasn't the point. Everyone, wake up. It looks like our shelter has been spotted. Instantly springing up as if he hadn't been asleep a moment before, Hyuga activated his Byakugan. Two standard teams of three led by Jounins, he reported. They're moving slowly in our direction and should be here in about four minutes. How on earth did they detect us in this rain with the barriers up? Inazuka growled, quickly packing up her bedding and arming herself with additional weapons. I put my supply scroll back into the inner pocket of my vest, threw on my cloak, and, with a small burst of chakra, ignited the smoldering lantern on the wall. I began examining the barrier seals carefully. The first one was fine, but the state of the second one made me curse. The moisture-resistant ink used in the seal had smudged and even dripped in one spot. Damn it! They sold me defective ink. Later, Ryo-san, the commander cut me off. It's too late to hide now, so let's go outside and wait for our guests. Nodding, I clapped my hands against the wall, turning it to rubble, and followed Hyuga out into the continuing night rain. Damn, now even Raitan is risky. It's easy to hit ourselves with lightning and catch our allies in the crossfire. Quickly positioning ourselves on one of the rocks to the right of our shelter, we waited for the enemy shinobi. Infusing my eyes with chakra, I gradually began to adapt to the pitch-black darkness caused by the terrible weather. It would be hard to make out all the details, but the chances of crashing into the rock were significantly reduced. It seemed that a tough fight was ahead, where the only real advantage would be for Hyuga and the sensors. The night and the wall of rain effectively concealed everything beyond a few meters of direct sight. I clicked on the microphone attached to my left ear. Narasan, can you welcome our guests with something? Hyuga asked quietly. If only I could see them, I grumbled in response, pressing the microphone button. They'll be right in front of us in 20 seconds. Got it. Without wasting any time, I began forming a rather long series of hand seals. Just as the six visible lights came within 30 meters, I released the gathered mass of chakra toward them. Swaytun. Daibaku Swishuha. The massive wave of water that surged forward was impressive, even though I expected something similar. With the moisture around, Swaytun techniques are stronger and less costly than usual. Though I lost sight of it almost immediately, my sensor abilities allowed me to track how the first trio, and a moment later the second, tried to evade the huge mass of water that was heading toward them. Only three managed to escape. Two Jounins who had developed a good speed to get out of the technique's range, and a shinobi who had sensed the danger earlier than the others. As for the three less fortunate Chunins, one simply didn't make it to the edge of the wave, the second was swept away along with his pitiful attempt to shield himself with a stone wall, and the third managed to sink halfway into the ground but was ultimately crushed with fatal results. However, 
the water mass that passed through carried away the captured shinobi and slammed them into a massive rock directly in the path, causing the ground to tremble beneath our feet and likely turning a couple of them into bloody splatters. In any case, the sparks from their sources instantly disappeared from my internal radar. Good job, three are destroyed and only the Jounins with the sensor remain, Huga announced over the comms. Of course, in this weather, it's a miracle they managed to avoid the strike at the last possible moment. Despite the terrible visibility and the wall of rain making it hard for anyone to use techniques other than Swayton, having a Byakugan user on our side gives us an edge in detection. Judging by the defensive positions taken by the enemy shinobi, it's clear they understand this well and are trying to protect their sensor. After all, through a wall of water, one can only detect the approximate location of the enemy. And even then, getting to them without tripping over the rocky terrain is another challenge. While chakra users do exceed ordinary humans in capability, they too struggle to fight well with significant visual and auditory interference. Naturally, this doesn't apply if you happen to have a couple of Byakugan or even Sharingan on hand. My supplies are still nearly full, so I can launch another area attack if you give me an approximate location. I replied to the commander. A moment later, Huga descended to my level on the cliff, raised his hand, and pointed to where I sensed the enemy chakra sources. That direction, about 50 meters from our position, he whispered, barely covering the sound of the falling rain. So hit them faster than your first jutsu. Understood. Pulling out one of my kanai from my pouch, I threw it forcefully in the indicated direction and almost immediately performed a series of hand seals. Kanai Keijbunshin no jutsu. I couldn't see how the thrown kanai multiplied into 150, forming a true wall of iron rapidly advancing toward the IWA shinobi. However, noticing the malicious smirk beginning to appear on the commander's face, I understood that the enemies would not be able to completely evade the attack this time either. Moments later, the smallest chakra source disappeared, and the remaining two began to close in. Inazuka with me and you two provide support, Hugo ordered and immediately jumped down, charging toward the Jounins. Sum followed closely behind with her dog, while Rotaro and I followed them. It took us only a few steps before the silhouettes of the enemy shinobi emerged from the darkness moving just a couple of meters apart from each other. Despite the horrible visibility, I managed to see that they had been hit by my technique, judging by their clothes which were cut in several places. This realization took only a fraction of a second, and the next moment several kanai with attached explosive tags flew towards us. Our team had to break formation and jump in different directions. The powerful explosions which would have hit us hard in another situation were significantly weakened due to the katan chakra used, and the pair of enemy shinobi were unable to do much more. Our taijutsu specialists simply didn't give them a chance. I waved Rotaro towards our teammate and followed the commander, figuring that the three of them would manage the jounins. Watching the lightning-fast exchanges of blows between the Byakugan user and the inconspicuous man in a bandana, dressed in the characteristic high-rank shinobi attire from a wagakure, I found myself enjoying the smooth and mesmerizing movements of the soft style. Even against an opponent armed with two knives, Huga's superiority in skill was evident. However, his opponent understood that if the Byakugan user got too close, the fight would be lost after a few hits getting through his defense. Moreover, the enemy Jounin had to keep an eye on me as well, which the commander was clearly trying to exploit. Still, he managed to keep Huga at a distance, flicking his knife blades dangerously in front of him. Except that I'd caught the moment when Hisashi was almost covering me with himself and used a technique without seals, standing slightly to the side of him. Sway-tun. Tepidama. Thanks to the Byakugan's advance warning, the commander was well-timed and sidestepped at the very last moment, letting the water core pass by and exposing the shinobi Iwagakure, who had no time to do anything. The technique bent him in half and Huga, who was instantly at his side, put an end to the brief fight with a single blow to his heart. When I was satisfied that the falling Jonin was no longer a threat, I stopped focusing on him and found his partner moving toward us, or rather, straight at me, leaving Inazuka and Ishii behind. I only had time to turn around and take a stand before a shadow flashed through the wall of rain. As I dodged a hail of desperate blows on reflex, I glimpsed that I was fighting a very skillful Kunoichi. 
but that didn't stop me from timing the moment when my opponent fell forward a little more than she could afford, and then I swung my right arm to the side past me and punched a powerful blow to the solar plexus, literally crushing the defense of my left. The crunch of injured ribs and limbs, heard even through the sound of the rain, put an end to our second fight, so that I had already decided that I could easily take the stunned Kunoichi captive, paying little attention to the frantic swing of her whole arm in my direction especially when it clearly didn't reach her head by a whole palm. But such self-confidence almost came to my detriment the next instant, when a mechanical click sounded and a narrow blade popped out of my sleeve. It was only at the last moment that my head was jerked backwards, allowing me to save my vision and get away with only a shattered bridge of my nose. Reflexively catching my wrist, I struck from below with my fist, breaking my arm and ignoring the brief shriek of pain immediately turning my palm toward the woman and activating the seal. The senbon that entered the eye socket almost full length cut off the Kunoichi's life a tenth of a second before Hyuga came to her aid. You okay? Almost. I nodded, stopping the blood and healing the bridge of her nose. I was glad that the blade was lubricated with a simple enough poison that I was immune to it. It was a good thing Iwagakure wasn't as popular with poisons as the sand people, or I'd be in trouble now. Come on. The others could use your help, the commander said as soon as he saw that I was finished. Is someone wounded? I was starting to worry as I jumped up after him. The sparks of the trio sources weren't going to die out right now, but some injuries, even if they weren't fatal, could put an end to a shinobi's career. Losing the same eyes, for example. I could help with that, but our mission would be in danger of failure, not to mention the reduction of the team's combat potential, which already reduces our chances of coming back alive. All three of us, Hyuga answered briefly. Oh shit! In the short time of fighting the opponents, we had scattered in different directions, so even taking a direct route, Hyuga and I had to run about half a kilometer before we could distinguish the figures of our teammates through the torrential rain. Even at first glance, it was clear that the agile Jounin had done quite a number on them. Rotaro was sitting on the ground, clutching a significant wound on his thigh, cursing through his teeth. Sum was carefully trying to remove a blade from her shoulder while casting worried glances at Karamaru, who had a stream of blood flowing from a vertical gash right through his eye. What bad luck! Without wasting time, I quickly assessed the damage and created a clone, sending it to the most severely injured, the dog, while I rushed to Ishii. Sum with her puncture wound could endure a little longer, but this pair was losing blood and weakening quickly. Ryo, did you deal with your own? My teammate noticed me. Yes, and yours too. I nodded, signaling him to remove his hands from the injured area. Serves that fast little bitch right with her blades. The guy hissed, obediently pulling the rake away from his thigh. The bleeding was stopped fairly quickly. Though the cut was wide, it wasn't as deep as it looked from the outside. However, before I could start stitching up the damaged muscles, I had to extract a small amount of poison that had already begun to spread slowly from the wound despite most of it being washed away with the copious bleeding. Ryo-san, how long will the treatment take? Hizashi asked Sum, continuing to monitor the surroundings with his eyes. About 20 minutes for proper treatment and 5 minutes just to patch up for short-term movement. I informed the commander, not diverting my attention from the task at hand. The dog has a superficial wound but lost an eye, so his combat effectiveness will be significantly reduced for the foreseeable future not to mention the increased blind spot. Added the clone, finishing cleaning out Karamaru's eye socket. Soom's treatment will take about 10 minutes, removing the mild poison and closing up a small hole. Nodding, the commander opened his mouth, about to say something, when he suddenly tensed, turned towards the likely arrival of a Wagakure shinobi, and started scanning the area. I had a gut feeling that even more trouble was coming. Two, three teams? No, for teams are moving towards us. He exclaimed after a brief silence. It looks like we won't have those ten minutes after all. It seems those patrols did send a message before the fight. Just what we needed. I groaned. We had barely handled two teams, and now there were four. Can Ishii move yet? Hisashi turned to me anxiously, finally dropping his usual mask of indifference. At least seven more minutes. I can't make it faster. I shrugged. Unfortunately, I'm not a magician, and I can't heal serious wounds in an instant. I have about the same time, the clone replied, 
Having finished with the dog and just starting on Inazuka's shoulder, she managed to remove the blade herself. How long until they get here? About eight minutes if they keep moving at the same speed. We won't have enough time to get far enough away for the rain to wash away all the traces we've left behind. Fight against four Jonin and eight Chunin by ourselves? No thanks. Sum, Karamaru. Come here. Leaving the half-healed wound alone. I stood up and pulled a scroll case from my pouch. What are you planning to do? They're not fighters right now anyway, so it's easiest to seal the injured and get out of here as quickly as possible. I replied to the commander. Then hurry up. Hyuga ordered irritably, turning away and focusing on the approaching enemies. He's starting to get nervous. Not that I blame him for it, but it's better not to get on his nerves. Unrolling the scroll on the wet stones, I turned to my partners. Hands and feet on the free seals, a small burst of chakra into each, and under the rain only two people remained. Done. The puff of smoke that formed after activation quickly dissipated under the raindrops, and I rolled up the completely dry scroll and put it back in the case. As soon as we reach a somewhat safer area, we can unseal them and tend to their injuries. Then let's go. Hugo took off but stopped after my shout. Moment. I pulled out the standard set of seals and threw them to the clone. You know what to do. Then I took off after the commander. With a few seals, the Kage Bunshin will definitely hold up the pursuers for a while. And if we're lucky, it might even kill someone. I explained to the Jonin facing me. Although I couldn't clearly distinguish his expression in the darkness, it was easy to guess the most obvious question. Only one clone? The quiet voice of the wielder of the dojitsu practically oozed skepticism. A clone with enough chakra for several decent Swayton techniques and seals, some of which can trap even an unwary jonin. I corrected him. We just have to hope the ink isn't from the last batch. Grunting, Hugo didn't argue but only increased his speed, splashing raindrops in all directions. Cursing, I sped up to keep up with him straining my eyes to avoid tripping over protruding stones or crashing into large boulders at the foot of the mountain. It seemed he had forgotten that I didn't have Biakugan and that seeing the outlines of the surrounding terrain in such weather and complete darkness is impossible for normal people. After a few seconds, I began to fall noticeably behind. Faster! The Jonin urged me. When I get such Biakugan, I'll gladly do so. I retorted and barely managed to notice a large stone ahead, knee-high, and successfully jumped over it. I understood the need to put as much distance between us and the pursuers as possible before they catch up with the clone. Now I could feel them at the edge of my senses. Unfortunately, despite the faint hope that it would only be a team of Chunin left to guard the fertile lands, among the sources were three that were not significantly weaker than the commander's team. And against even three Jonin with support, we simply couldn't manage, even under the most favorable circumstances. Damn Bijou! Swearing, Hizashi slowed down a bit, and as soon as we were even, he put his hand on my shoulder. Shun Shin! I was jerked, twisted, and transported to a new location. Before I could recover from the technique which always felt worse when you had to serve as dead weight, he used the technique again and then again and again. After the fifth Shun Shin and a quarter of my partner's remaining reserve, we found ourselves about four kilometers from the previous location. Letting out a tired sigh, the Jonin removed his hand and, after a ten-second breather, began running again, though at a much slower pace, so I had no trouble keeping up without fearing for my neck. What's the plan? Considering the circumstances and the high chance of a pursuit, we won't stop until we reach the designated area, where we will set up a concealed refuge and wait for the courier, Hugo replied. Since the target might appear within two to three days, You'll have enough time to get the others ready in case you need to escort the courier. Nodding, I didn't want to distract him further. A minute later, even through the noise of the night rain, we heard faint sounds of explosions. A clone? No, most likely it was a Kekiai Genkai trap. I waved my hand dismissively. Besides, there were also regular Kibakufida in the pack. But judging by the fact that the clone hasn't dissipated yet, they haven't reached it. Let's hope it reduces the number of Chunin, Hugo grunted. But given that no one has appeared in my line of sight yet, if they do have sensors, they're likely worse than those of the destroyed teams. Or they could be distracted by a decoy, I countered. 
After all, a Kage Bunshin's reserve exceeds that of an ordinary Chunin, and they might think that only one survivor was left after our supposed detection. The Jonin wiped his face with his sleeve from the raindrops and glanced at me. Forget it. The important thing is that we manage to escape and the mission isn't jeopardized by another pointless fight. At any other time, I'd gladly stay to set up an ambush even against this many enemies, but obtaining information about the courier's routes is far more important right now. PFF as if I'm accusing him of a hasty retreat. I'd rather not die against superior forces of a Wagakure shinobi, so I definitely won't fight to the last drop of blood in an initially unfavorable situation. Unlike idiots with their fire-washed brains. What? The memories of the destroyed clone made me slow down and frown with irritation. Dying from a dozen earth spikes piercing from all sides isn't very pleasant. It seems that, among the Jonin, someone has a strong affinity with Dotan to use techniques even in such weather. The only comforting thing is that the Kage Bunshin managed to use the remaining chakra on Bunshin Bakuhatsu before disappearing, not only blowing itself up but also taking out a Jonin nearby, and likely causing a real rain of stone shrapnel. Although I doubt that person died from it, they were definitely incapacitated for a while. The decoy was destroyed, but the enemies also took significant losses. I informed the commander, switching to a walk. Excellent. How many? At least two Chunin dead, another one injured, and I'm not sure about the other one, and one injured Jonin for sure, possibly even badly hurt if he didn't manage to protect himself from the explosion. So, there are two Jonin and three Chunin left, Hizashi pondered. We could try to finish them off, there's a chance. We've already expended quite a bit of chakra and they're still fresh, I noted. I wonder why he's so bloodthirsty. Did he lose comrades in the war with IWA? Moreover, I looked up, ignoring the rain. It's starting to get light, and in a few minutes we won't have such a significant visibility advantage. The Jonin grimaced in annoyance but agreed with my points. Then let's move on. We still have at least four hours before we need to find shelter to avoid being spotted by the locals. Well, if we must, then let's go. We've almost left the foothills behind, and running on relatively flat ground covered with grass has become much easier. Soon, we'll reach cultivated lands and roads, allowing us to move even faster and leave any potential pursuers far behind. Quickly leaving the dangerous area with enemy teams behind, we abandoned stealth and, channeling chakra through our bodies, accelerated to a running speed that not every jonin can maintain. Although the sky was just beginning to lighten and the rain was still pouring like a bucket, it allowed us to see the surrounding terrain more clearly. I sighed with relief as I reduced the chakra flow to my eyes, which were starting to ache from overuse, compounded by the headwind and water. Unfortunately, the channels in such delicate parts of the body need to be developed very cautiously, even with the advantages of the Uzumaki clan's excellent Karakuke. Unfortunately, I hadn't thought to work on this earlier for such a case of poor visibility. Usually, a small amount of chakra to the eyes is enough to clearly distinguish the environment even in scant starlight, let alone moonlight. I need to remember that. About five minutes into running, my partner and I emerged onto a stone-paved road, which was clearly the one Hyuga had been aiming for, and we continued along it, fortunately heading in the right direction. Such direct and reckless behavior, key roads are usually much better guarded, can lead to unpleasant consequences, such as running into well-hidden traps, but only if you don't have a Hyuga clan member with you, whose eyes can spot small details from several kilometers away. So now, with our main concern being speed, it made sense to use more convenient routes without additional obstacles in the form of terrain. Given that the overwhelming majority of enemies, surely gathered from the entire guarded area, were left behind, and in such an early and murderous time and weather, no local would be out on the street, we could not fear detection for at least another couple of hours, slipping past cultivated fields and small villages where farmers lived like two silent shadows. About an hour into our run, we had to make a wide detour around the governor's castle. Although shinobi weren't expected in the settlements, Hizashi had detected several chakra users at Chunin level and decided to err on the side of caution. After all, the courier might change the route if a message about detected enemy activity arrives in Awagakure. We definitely don't want that. To be honest, I had no idea about the change of terrain and current orientation, just following the jonin, 
who was clearly able to distinguish the right direction from any other. Even though the map shown by the commander had more or less detailed information about the enemy territory we were crossing, when you can't see more than a few hundred meters in any direction, all the marked landmarks become useless, especially at such speeds. Working my legs monotonously and trying not to leave traces of chakra use on the stone road, I almost missed the sign from the guide indicating a change of course. Following the suddenly slowing and turning Hizashi, I caught up with him and, with a few signs, inquired about the reason. Forward post ahead. The road further deviates from our direction. The four signs explained the situation and I merely shrugged. It was bound to happen sooner or later. We had managed to cover a huge distance in nearly three hours. I wouldn't be surprised if the commander in charge of this area had decided to pull all his available forces to the alert signal just in case. He would have succeeded if not for the damned weather. However, if it weren't for the strong rain outside, no one would have noticed us with my barriers. Another half an hour and we'll be there. Understood. And much earlier than we had anticipated during the planning of the operation. The courier might appear not this evening but tomorrow. Considering that the route for delivering documents and orders for Shinobi usually passes through posts, we have some certainty about the location for the ambush. Although such posts are typically located at considerable distances from each other within the heart of the territory, the chance of encountering a patrol precisely when capturing the prisoner could impact both the success of the mission and the survival of the team members. It will be Hizashi's task to determine the point where we'll set up our ambush while waiting for our target. This is a challenging task even with the dojitsu capable of seeing kilometers around. Unfortunately, the broken prisoner did not provide exact coordinates down to the meter, and we would have to rely more on luck than on the available information. Then, we would need to quickly escape before the disappearance was discovered, and the guards who didn't wait for the courier raised the alarm and mobilized all available forces for a sweep, bringing in truly formidable opponents. Moving predominantly across rocky ground or sparse trees, so even the most experienced tracker wouldn't detect that someone had passed through. Occasionally encountering small groves on our path, we reached the designated point Hizashi had chosen, which turned out to be a small hill. We then began setting up a shelter where the team would spend the next couple of days. Well, when I say began, I mean that the Jonin stood on guard as if he didn't have the necessary skills, while I used earth manipulation to create a burrow that resembled a small earthen shelter where four shinobi could stay with some comfort, without the danger of flooding from the still persistent rain outside. Naturally, I didn't forget to set up a barrier to dampen the use of significant amounts of chakra. Despite my weak affinity with this element, even a novice can create and reinforce cavities in the earth to a stony state by channeling chakra into the area. This is how even a single Dotan user of Jonin Caliber can dig an entire network of tunnels and bunkers if given enough time and ensuring stealth from sensors. Still, such an approach will show up for kilometers around if the created cavities are close to the surface. After reinforcing the walls and sealing to ensure the small hill wouldn't collapse on us, I pushed aside the layer of earth with grass and, wiping my wet hands on a similarly damp cloak, sighed with relief. Even with my chakra reserves, controlling such a stubborn at the moment element is quite costly and difficult. Taicho, everything is ready, I informed Hizashi. Having worked with several Hugas in a team, I long ago understood some of the nuances of their dojitsu, aside from the well-known blind spot in their circular vision. Although the white-eyed prideful claim that when the Byakugan is activated, they see the entire field of view up to the individual limits of its capabilities, this is not entirely true. A Hyuga must focus on a specific area in their field of vision to get a clear picture of the terrain and the objects within it. Meanwhile, in other areas, they might miss objects that do not stand out from the background or overlook something right under their nose when focusing on the distance. The comparison is more fitting with ordinary human vision, where the gaze focuses on one thing while everything else is perceived peripherally. It's pretty much the same for the white-eyed. Only with age do dojitsu users learn to spread their attention over a larger area of view. I doubt anyone achieves a full hundred percent of the Byakugan's capabilities. It's too much of a strain on the brain, which isn't accustomed to processing significant amounts of information. And this is not just my guess, but a well-established fact from observations of patients. I've had subjects, I mean patients. Both clans with keen eyes have brain activity that's slightly higher than the average shinobi without dojitsu. Excellent, the jonin said, 
turning around. He focused and with a single burst of chakra removed the water that had soaked into his clothes, then ducked into the low entrance of the shelter. Thanks for the shower. After giving Hizashi's back an irritated glance, I released chakra from my tenketsu, first converting it to sway ton, then gathered all the moisture on me into a sphere and tossed it aside. Collecting barrier seals that had withstood the moisture, I followed the commander inside and put up new ones on the walls. Adjusting the lighting with weak pulses, I closed the entrance with a layer of carved earth and fused the edges, leaving only a barely noticeable slit for ventilation. From the outside, the hill would look completely untouched even to the most scrutinizing gaze, and the absence of any sign of living creature chakra would not arouse suspicion. Unpacking my sleeping gear, I tossed my cloak aside and stretched out in full length, grateful that the size of the space allowed for it. The sudden wave of fatigue, having barely slept at all during the night, even started to make me drowsy, but the rustling of paper from the jonin snapped me back. Turning my head, I saw that he had pulled out a ration bar and was just starting to unwrap it. In the dim light of the seals, I even thought Hizashi grimaced in disgust before he began to chew. Despite the almost identical feelings, I fought the urge to lie down and sleep and also started to snack. I had enough work ahead, and chakra reserves are replenished faster with a full stomach, regardless of the taste of the food and the urge to vomit. On sight was Rotaro's first question as soon as I unpacked the team in the new shelter. Yes, now we just need to wait for the courier and get out of here as quickly as possible. I nodded, immediately resuming treatment of the wound. And where is Karamaru? Sum asked, puzzled, as soon as she noticed her pet was missing among us. Still sealed, I answered without looking up from my work. Given your dog's condition, Karamaru won't be of any use in a fight right now, and retrieving him just for a simple check. Inazuka growled angrily but didn't argue, merely scowling and irritably shrugging her shoulders. However, her not completely healed wound made itself known, and the Kunoichi grimaced in pain. Sighing, I shook my head but said nothing. Unfortunately, for this dog-loving clan, controlling their emotions and instincts is something not everyone manages, even to their own detriment, and my partner is undoubtedly among them. So, I've healed your leg as well as possible in this case, but don't strain it too much for now, I concluded with Ishii. Thanks, Ryo. Sumchan. Come here. You say that as if I'm just a regular dog. The girl shot me a sidelong glance moving closer under Rotaro's quiet laughter. As if that would be an insult to you, I replied with a smirk. Come on, give me your shoulder. Understanding her wound turned out to be even faster. The clone cleaned the wound well and removed the poison. However, there was somehow too little poison. Most likely, the bulk of it was washed away by the rain during the fight, and only a very small amount of the already not very deadly poison affected my partner. Fortunately, Good poison that doesn't wash off the blade immediately is quite expensive, and most of its users prefer to use cheaper alternatives that act quickly once they enter the bloodstream. All done with the hole so you can rest now. Patting Tsum on the shoulder, I moved toward my futon. Personally, that's exactly what I intend to do, since the captain will have to keep watch all this time. Given that we haven't had a proper rest after a hard day, I completely agree with you. It seems I fell asleep even before my head touched the pillow roll. He's running, jumping out of bed. I didn't immediately grasp what was happening, but after pressing a couple of points on my head, I instantly woke up and realized that the commander had spotted our target. Finally, Sum, who had been nearby, jumped up. How far is the courier? Ishii asked, rapidly gathering and packing his things. I kept pace with him but first opened the entrance letting the daylight in, and peeled the seals off the walls before sealing my bed in a travel scroll. How much time do we have to set up an ambush? The courier is 8 kilometers northwest of us and is moving slightly off from our hideout toward the nearest post. At the current speed, we have 4 minutes to intercept him and about a couple of minutes to set up the ambush, Hizashi replied, being the first to rush outside. We followed him. Are you sure it's a courier? I asked the Jounin while running. Given the presence of scrolls in his backpack and the highly developed chakra channels in his legs compared to the rest of the Kirikwiki? Undoubtedly. It seems the captured language forgot to mention that the courier might appear a bit earlier than the stated time. Not later. 
Tsung growled, falling a step behind us. Maybe, but the night attack even played into our hands then. Rotaro shrugged. Otherwise, we wouldn't have made it here in time, and we'd have to wait for the next one or head home empty-handed. I grimaced and turned to the Jounin. What's the plan? Standard Ishi-san covers us with an illusion, you catch him. I disable his chakra, and Inazuka-san provides backup in case of surprises. Standard squad tactics when there's a Nara and a Hyuga. Here, Hizashi stopped near a small thicket of bushes in a dip between a couple of very low hills. He will appear from that side in about three minutes. Let's go. Nodding, Rotaro began forming a long series of seals. While I stepped into the shadow of the bushes to make the task easier and reduce chakra consumption for the use of the jutsu. Digging into my pocket, I pulled out the required paper and handed it to the commander. Then knelt and formed the concentration seal, channeling chakra into the slightly darkened shadow beneath me. Once my partner cast the illusion on us, the entire team positioned themselves to the side and slightly behind me to avoid obstructing the view and disrupting my technique. I glanced at the almost clear sky, focusing on the spot where the chakra source I had detected a couple of minutes ago should have appeared by now. It was a relief that even the fertile lands of Tsuchi no Kuni were far from a flat plain. Otherwise, we would have been spotted from afar, ruining all our plans. Moreover, the weather had been sunny after the rain, and the available shadow was sufficient to immobilize an entire team without much trouble, let alone a single person. He will appear soon, Hizashi whispered warningly, tensing for a forward leap. In the next second, a figure of a person appeared on the distant hill. Instantly tracking the shinobi's movement trajectory, I determined that he would run about 12 meters from our position, which was when we should attack. Meanwhile, I had a moment to examine the courier. The man, appearing to be around 30, was in standard chunin attire, with a small bag slung over his shoulder, a couple of pouches on his belt, and one on his leg. A village symbol was visible on his left arm, and a dark blue headband was wrapped around his head, covering his eyebrows and nearly sliding over his eyes. An ordinary shinobi without any notable features, of which there were many on both sides of the front. The only exception was that his eyes were slightly more slanted than most of the local population. I didn't scrutinize him further, just glanced quickly and continued to watch the shadow. Even a green genin knows that a keen gaze can be easily sensed, and veterans have this sense finely developed, or they wouldn't have lived to their age. This guy was about the right age, couriers are frequently taken out even in peacetime, let alone during a war, so a courier needs not only fast legs but also a good sense for trouble to live a long life. This was confirmed by the Chunin, who began to swivel his head as he approached the Jinjutsu placed on the area. But it was too late. Kageme no Jutsu. I whispered quietly, more for the team than for myself. The thin shadow needle shot forward, covering 20 meters almost instantly and almost invisibly to the eye. But even so, the Chunin managed to notice something, making a final attempt to jerk sideways and wave his arms. But at that exact moment, our shadows merged, and the courier stood rooted to the spot as the thin thread on the ground transformed into a wide rope. Got him. The following Hyuga performed 128 touches of the sky, blocking the use of primary Tenketsu and finishing by slapping a seal on the man's forehead, causing him to collapse in a technique's hold. Like clockwork, Rotaro grunted with satisfaction and began moving toward the prisoner. Satisfied that the Chunin wasn't going to resist, I ended the Jutsu, allowing the unconscious body to drop to the ground, and rising from my knee, followed him, retrieving the prisoner's scroll case from the pouch on my belt. Excellent work. The commander turned to us, deactivating his Byakugan and even managing a faint smile. Now we just need to get out of enemy territory. But his praise was suddenly interrupted by a soft whistling sound from the fallen shinobi's body. And before anyone could react, some object shot up and exploded above us with a deafening bang emitting a red signal flare visible even on a sunny day from afar. A signal flare. But when did he manage that? Voiced the thoughts of everyone. The only Kunoichi in the squad. Ryo-san. Seal him and let's go. Commanded Hizashi, now serious. Enemies will be here soon. And we need to get as far away from this place as possible. Quickly unrolling the scroll on the damp grass. I placed the courier's hand on the free seal and... After a small chakra impulse, 
jumped to my feet and rushed after the others, stowing it back in the case. Damn, what bad luck and how to deal with it. What are we going to do? Run away from the search party as soon as the rocks figure out our diversionary group is in their rear. Sum gritted her teeth, making a rather frightening face. Even the dumbest person will connect the recent incident at the rocks with the attack and subsequent kidnapping of the courier not too far from there. And also figure out where to expect us from. We can't go back the old way, Hugo said gravely. They'll definitely be waiting for us there. As for finding another route to the front line. Even if we manage, reinforcements will still end up in a different place. Ishii noted and suggested. Maybe we should try to blend in with the locals and wait for the commotion to die down? They certainly won't think to look for us at the Lord's Castle. With that amount of chakra? It won't work, not to mention the hair color of some of us. The Jounin shot a glance at me. Besides, we don't have local clothing, and the Chunin outfit would only fit you. And the Byakugan is hard to hide. I added, retorting. Unless you pretend to be blind, but I haven't seen many chubby disabled people. Hizashi's cheek twitched, and I smirked triumphantly behind my mask but he chose not to continue the argument. However, it served its purpose. The tense teammates relaxed a bit and were no longer on the verge of panicking. Then we have no choice but to flee towards the land of grass as quickly as possible and hope for the best, Inazuka concluded. More precisely, we should try to reach the mountains as finding anyone there, even with sensors, is not an easy task. The commander corrected her. Besides, I don't think they have anyone who can surpass me in sensitivity. In short, just like before, but now we didn't have the rain that provided excellent cover from enemy sensors and a big advantage for the Byakugan. Naturally, I didn't mention this to avoid lowering the team's morale, so we continued running in silence. As long as our legs were working, I was racking my brain on how to get everyone out of this tough situation. I could escape almost guaranteed and no one would blame me for leaving my comrades behind, especially if the mission was accomplished. But leaving behind people I had become attached to over the years without even trying to lead them out with me? I can admit to myself that I'm prepared to do that, but I don't think the others would approve of such behavior. At the same time, I don't want to reveal certain aspects of the Jutsu using discovered chakra separation abilities in strict proportions. My thoughts were interrupted by Hizashi, who suddenly signaled to stop, and a couple of seconds later, dashed toward the nearest patch of forest that was almost transparent. I was tempted to ask about such a hasty move to a place that was at least somewhat suitable for cover, but then I felt on the edge of my senses about a dozen chakra sources moving toward us, directly where the signal flare had exploded. It would have been manageable if they were Chunin led by two Jounin, with that number we might have a chance, especially considering the low quality of Iwagakure fighters compared to ours. But one pulsating chakra source of truly gigantic size changed the entire situation. No wonder Hyuga became so cautious. I particularly disliked the ambiguous and heavier feeling of the chakra from this monster. A very familiar sensation, reminiscent of a certain plump tomato after the repackaging ritual, Jinshuriki, slipping past another tree toward the target only Hizashi could see, I thought anxiously about the strategy for fighting a Jinshuriki if we were unlucky. The most obvious solution, at the first opportunity, use chains to prevent the Jinchuriki from using Biju Chakra and apply the sealing technique to cut off the connection with the beast and virtually deprive the most powerful shinobi of his strength. Nothing else will work on these chakra monsters, and if we deploy heavy artillery, we should definitely order a coffin in advance, as shinobi from all around will converge on us. Down! Jumping into a small ravine that was completely unnoticed even from a couple of steps away, I looked questioningly at Hizashi. Set up the barrier and pray were not spotted. Setting it up took only a few seconds, and then we all pressed ourselves to the ground, trying to become as inconspicuous as possible. Taicho, what happened? Sum dared to whisper after a tense ten seconds of waiting. Rushi, Hugo whispered with his lips only. Who? The Kunoichi asked back with a puzzled look. Jinshuriki. The commander replied, clearly indicating that if she didn't shut up, death at the hands of enemies would seem merciful. However, Sum was a smart girl and was aware of who they were, as she turned very pale and even started to tremble. Yeah, the reputation of Jinchuriki precedes them. I even had to take her hand to calm her down a bit. To Ishii's puzzled face, I just silently waved. Later, 
The three minutes it took for Rushi and company to pass by and disappear from my senses felt like an eternity. But when Hizashi finally relaxed and wiped the sweat from his forehead, a very good idea struck me on how to get out without losses and keep my abilities a secret. Major abilities, as some things would need to be revealed. So why is everyone so twitchy? My teammate asked, puzzled. We nearly ran into a Jinchuriki, a host of a tailed beast, I explained, observing with some satisfaction as Ishii paled, realizing what a big mess had just passed us. We could have gotten caught. Taicho, I have an idea on how to get us out of here without losses and much faster. I addressed the now relaxed Hizashi. It can't get worse, so go ahead. He waved his hand. Actually, it's quite simple. I'll seal you all in here. I patted the pouch with the case. Summon a creature that seals me inside, then it swallows the scroll and runs back to our territory much more stealthily than an entire team of shinobi and, in most cases, faster. Once on our territory, it will perform the reverse procedure. The straightforward and almost safe. You have a summon? Sum asked, surprised. While the commander rubbed his chin in thought and nodded a moment later. However, I wasn't surprised after the recent encounter with the Jinchuriki, and he had already appreciated the convenience of transporting the wounded in the scroll. They're cats, so it's better if you don't encounter them. I honestly warned the Kunoichi, who was practically vibrating with curiosity. Sealing three people took only a few moments. After that, I didn't use the summon but focused and created a shadow clone. You know what to do. I nodded to him and placed my hand on the empty seal on the scroll. In a small puff of smoke, the remaining one in the ravine, the clone, who only resembled his creator in form, calmly folded and put away the scroll in the case, retrieved the barrier seals, and swallowed everything with an unnaturally wide open mouth. After that, he stepped into the densest shadow and vanished without leaving a trace of his existence behind. In a moment, I found myself not in the small ravine but in the midst of a barren, rocky ridge with small patches of green grass in rare spots, which turned into deep fissures in the ground a few hundred meters away. This was exactly where we had run through on our way deeper into the land of stones. However, the time didn't match. It was the dead of night now, and only the light of the full moon allowed me to clearly see the surroundings. Turning to my clone, I nodded, and in a moment received all the memories from the dispelled technique. Aha, now I understand why he didn't get us to the vicinity of the camp and had to unseal us on conditionally enemy territory. Unlike the extended time shadows can stay in the world, the moment of changing day to night doesn't allow for such free movement through the shadow world as sunlight or moonlight does. The clone had expended so much chakra moving during this period that he only managed to get us to around 3 in the morning before he had to unseal me to avoid exhausting his chakra reserves. Given the distance covered, it was a pretty good result for about half a day. Our team clearly took longer for this segment of the journey. Sighing tiredly, unfortunately, fatigue doesn't go away during sealing. I crouched in front of the scroll and, unfolding it further, sequentially placed my finger on each of the last three seals and sent a chakra impulse. Three consecutive pops with a slight puff of smoke increased the number of people around by three. Is that it? Sum asked, blinking in surprise. That's all? I grumbled. Pulling the scroll from under the hands of my teammates and putting it back in the nearby case. After rearranging the remaining items from the clone into their places, I responded to the commander's nod with one of my own and waited while Huga inspected the area for enemies. Though I knew that within a 7 kilometer radius, there was no other being capable of using chakra except us, of course. Once Hizashi had determined the landmarks in the area, he silently gestured for us to follow him. Forming a diamond-shaped formation, we set off after the Jonin who had already picked up a good pace. However, the three of us managed well and even had time to chat on the way. More accurately, my teammates gave me a little interrogation. So, when did you manage to get a summoning contract? The Kunoichi, who had been throwing curious glances at me for the last few minutes, finally asked. And why haven't you used it before? Never, I shrugged. And I didn't have much need for it. What do you mean, never? How did you use a summon then? Rataro, who was also listening behind, asked in surprise. Quite simply... I have a scroll that allows me to summon a specific cat that can serve as a courier for delivering messages. I turn my head to Inazuka, and it's good for nothing else. Besides, considering its bad temper, 
I try not to overuse this ability. All right, that's clear. Sum nodded and continued the interrogation. What breed is it? And who gave you the scroll? Glimpsing at the girl who was literally radiating curiosity, I sighed but decided to enlighten my teammates. I received the scroll from Mito-sama, who, along with some other shinobi from the Uzumaki clan, holds this summoning contract. As for the breed, they are panthers and they really don't like being couriers, so I prefer to use ordinary methods for delivering messages. I suppose having a summon is pretty cool, even such a limited one, Ishii sighed a little enviously. Well, what's stopping you from getting your own? I shrugged and, jumping over a rather large rock after Hisashi, continued. You can find the necessary scrolls readily available among similar information in the village library. So go for it if you really want to. Maybe I should give it a try. Just don't forget that about 98% out of 100 never return to their summoning world. Tsum scoffed. It's almost a guaranteed death for nearly every fool who wanted to get a summon. And what about the third Hokage students and Sukumo Hitaki? My partner countered reasonably, not paying much attention to the Kunoichi's sarcastic tone. If we go by your words, only one should have survived, not all four. Firstly, Sukumo-sama's summon of dogs has been passed down through his clan for several generations so he wasn't taking any risks by simply signing the scroll. Secondly, the Sanin were already much stronger than the average Jounin at that time, so their chance to impress their summoning animals was much higher than many other candidates, Inazuka listed. And thirdly, neither you nor I have enough chakra to summon even a large beast, let alone a boss, which is a universal requirement among all summons. You know quite a lot about summons, I remarked. Considering that our clan has been trying to buy or exchange a dog summoning scroll from the Hitaki since almost the founding of Kanoha, it's only natural that we studied all the possible pitfalls of summons and tried to make a direct contract by entering the world of dogs. Sum snorted. You can guess the result. None of those who tried ever came back. It's well known that it's much easier to find an already created scroll and try to gain the summon's consent with it than to attempt to make a new one by moving to the appropriate world. Hizashi unexpectedly added, clearly listening to our conversation. Among those who have reached the level of Jounin, trying to obtain a contract is considered a twisted form of suicide rather than a way to increase personal power. Even Kaga-level shinobi are not immune to failure. As for the Sanin, such success is largely due to their teacher's connection with the monkeys rather than anything else. If signing summoning contracts were that easy, such scrolls would be present by the dozens in every village instead of the few that currently exist. I was personally acquainted with two who tried their luck. None returned. Well, think about whether it's worth risking for a slim chance of personal enhancement with almost guaranteed death, or if it's better to do without a summon. After such a rather pessimistic explanation about summons, Rotaro's enthusiasm noticeably waned. I would have also considered it if I were in his place. Naturally, the desire to chat while running disappeared among the team, which was probably what Hyuga aimed for, so we continued in silence. Despite the ongoing skirmishes on both sides, we didn't encounter any Iwagakure no Sato Shinobi teams on the way back and reached the camp without incidents by the evening of the next day. The lack of need to conceal our presence significantly affected the team's speed of movement. Under the watchful eyes of the sentries on the walls, after overcoming the defensive trap zone, we found ourselves inside, and the commander immediately went to report the successful completion of the mission, taking the unconscious prisoner from me beforehand. All that remained was to be glad for the chance to rest. Despite what seemed like a quick completion of the mission thanks to my idea, the constant tension and inability to sleep properly in enemy territory clearly took their toll on me, more in mental fatigue than physical, unlike my partners. Returning Tsum's pet, I waved at both of them and trudged to my tent, automatically responding to the welcoming nods of those around me, dreaming only of a normal bed, a full eight hours of peace and quiet. Senpai, Senpai, Ryo Senpai. Hearing that familiar, high-pitched voice, I mentally groaned and fought the urge to pretend I was deaf. I'd probably never see my favorite pillow again. Turning in the direction of the calls, I confirmed my fears. It was indeed Shifuyu Uchiha rushing from the infirmary. Kohai, I nodded, letting out a resigned sigh. Senpai, you're back. I urgently need your help. Without stopping, 
the Kunoichi ran up, grabbed my hand, and dragged me back. I'll find out who reported this. I'll make them regret it. I only stumbled out of the infirmary three hours later, completely exhausted, angry, and also hungry, as we had grabbed our rations on the move around three in the afternoon, and it had been over eight hours since then. So the first thing on my to-do list was to get some food of any kind, followed by sleep. And if anyone tries to delay my well-deserved rest again, they'll regret it deeply. Rio, Rio, hearing my name just as I reached the threshold of my tent, I suppressed the urge to bash my head against the nearest rock. Why did I let myself be talked into this? Turning back with resignation, I saw a very tired Rotaro hurrying through the camp. He looked definitely drunk and, judging by his clothes, had spent time with his girlfriend. Still, his worried face made me uneasy. I could almost sense, if not imminent trouble, then at least some unpleasant news. After all, my partner wouldn't be looking for me at such a late hour without a good reason. Rio, did you hear? Rotaro asked, after stopping and catching his breath. Heard what? Didn't you hear? The reinforcements Jenin should have already spread the word to everyone. Jenin? I interrupted Ishii. Are they sending Jenin to the front now? Have the advisors and Hokage completely lost their minds? What the hell? This situation isn't serious enough to throw newly graduated academy kids into the war's grinder. Even Anoki is keen on preserving his Jenin despite the dire state of his forces. Forget about the Jenin. The commander isn't planning to send them beyond the camp's perimeter, my friend dismissed. The real issue is, Kanoha has been attacked. What? The news that the village had been attacked hit me like a sledgehammer. I could only stare blankly at my partner, struggling to grasp the fact that despite the fully closed borders from Iwa's side, someone had managed to secretly mobilize enough forces to launch a serious attack on Kanoha, even with significantly weakened defenses. It's baffling, considering the village always has at least a couple of thousand active shinobi, not to mention Danzo's forces. Yeah, I had the exact same shock when I heard the news, Ishii nodded, assessing my reaction. When did this happen? I managed to ask, overcoming my shock. Six days ago, the news took some time to reach the main camp, and only then did the dispatched Genin reinforcements bring the news to us. Number of attackers? Casualties? Damage? I tried not to think about how my overworked friend Saya would eagerly jump into the thick of the fight as soon as the opportunity arose, rather than staying behind to defend the clan quarter. Over the years, I had come to know her restless nature quite well. Currently, nothing specific is known, including how the enemy managed to get so close without the patrols detecting them until the last moment. The Chunin shrugged, clearly not too concerned about the matter. Well, he has no relatives at home and his girlfriend is in the camp, so he has no reason to worry. There's no need to be concerned about Mito, and Kushinachan has a battery for instant regeneration and enhancement, not to mention the protection for Jinchuriki. Saya, however, is just an ordinary Kunoichi without the vast chakra reserves and enhanced durability of the Uzumaki. And something tells me that she'll definitely get into trouble at the first opportunity. Alright, if anything else comes up, don't forget to let me know. I'm always out of the loop with the infirmary, I sighed, feeling even more tired. For now, I'm going to get some rest, and thanks for the update. One thing I didn't doubt was the speed at which rumors and news circulate among shinobi. In the absence of my usual TV and radio, news spreads verbally, turning real killing machines into gossiping ants. And the profession sort of justifies it, even though shinobi here aren't spies and assassins but rather overly showy mages with a Japanese flair, even though there are hardly any of those with narrow eyes around. It was different back at Kanoha's main hospital. News practically came directly from the primary sources on the field. All right, Ryo, I'll keep you updated. My partner clapped me on the shoulder. Rest up. Nodding at him, I noticed a bit late that the guy no longer needed to stretch just to reach my shoulder. Somehow, I had missed the fact that Rotaro had already grown to a solid meter 70 and change, while just a year ago he hadn't even reached a meter 55 and was the shortest in the team. I barely had time to blink and he turned into such a tall guy. Watching my partners retreating back, I tiredly stretched my shoulders and shuffled back to my tent. I was incredibly tired, but before sleeping, 
I needed to write a letter to add to the pile that would be sent by courier to the main camp and then to the village. It's not very fast, but much more reliable than sending it with a bird. The following days dragged on at a snail's pace, despite the fact that there was enough work for two people. The persistent feeling of anxiety in my chest was slowly and steadily eroding my bastions of calm and discipline. Not to mention, it was impossible to fall asleep without thoughts of a specific nature invading my mind. The only consolation was the impossibility of being taken captive in my own village, but that was a weak comfort compared to the worst-case scenario. I certainly didn't want to attend another funeral upon returning to Kanoha, especially not Sayas. As usual, the accumulating emotional fatigue led to mistakes. Hissing in pain from a kanai wound in my leg, I accelerated with a burst of chakra and, slashing the chunin with a katana that emerged from a seal, rolled to the side, dodging several more attacks sent by his partner. Though the injury had weakened me somewhat, reducing my speed, blocking out the sensations wasn't difficult. After sealing my weapon, I unleashed a storm of iron on the remaining enemy using palm seals. The short shinobi in the bandana managed to dodge the first dozen attacks, but the shuriken and sunbon flying at high speed first grazed his shoulder and then turned him into a real pincushion. Taking a quick glance around, I confirmed that my assistance wasn't needed. Sum was finishing off her opponent, Karamaru had already bitten the throat of a kunoichi who had exposed herself, and Rotaro was successfully holding off his shinobi with his sword. He carefully pulled a kunai out of his wound and started treating his leg. By the time my teammates dealt with the remaining members of the Iwagakure team that had tried to slip past the front line, I was able to stand properly without blocking my nerves. Just think. I managed to get hit by a kanai from a lowly chunin while most jounin couldn't even reach me. Ryo, are you alright? The worried faces of Tsum and Rotaro made me feel even worse. They were used to me looking after them, and here I was injured against two chunins. Yes, I'm fine now, I nodded to them pulling out a scroll for bodies from the vest pouch. Stop zoning out and pay more attention to what's happening around you. The kunoichi frowned, poking me in the side with her knuckles. If the opponents had been more serious, that mistake could have cost you your life. Sorry. Guys, I sighed, pushing my glasses up to my forehead and rubbing my face with my palms. I'm focused now. You should have done that when we first started patrolling. Ishii shook his head. Fortunately, they didn't continue to chastise me, and we could seal the bodies and continue our route. As I jumped from stone to stone, I regretted that my last decent pair of pants had also developed a hole, meaning I'd have to mend them in the evening, as there were no replacements left. Though some fighters wore even worse clothing, it didn't affect their combat skills. The response letters only arrived on the ninth day, by which time I was already fraught with anxiety and had avoided approaching the more delicate patients, as just yesterday I had nearly killed a boy due to a trembling hand. The letters had arrived, but not for me. The only consolation was that no death notices had come, unlike for some in the camp. The tightly wound spring of anxiety began to slowly unwind. If they weren't dead, they could always be healed, even if it required dismantling a couple of bodies. Still, the uncertainty was stressful. Meanwhile, my workload increased and not due to enemy actions. Upon receiving the death notices, a couple of shinobi had committed suicide. As I later learned from Shifuyu, one had lost his wife and year-old child, while the other had lost his entire family, including parents and a bunch of younger siblings. Another had been subdued by his teammates halfway and was brought to the infirmary. There would have been a fourth case, but while anxiously pacing around the camp, I managed to restrain a young fool who had tried to slit her own throat and handed her over to her arriving friends. Although Saya's status was still unclear, I managed to learn some details about the attack on Kanoha. The assistant allowed me to read part of her letter, which described the circumstances of the event. 200 Awagakure shinobi somehow managed to sneak through the territory of Amigakure, bypassing less stringent patrols on the border of the countries. In small groups, they reached the territory of Honokuni, where, avoiding attention, they proceeded towards the well-known location of the Hidden Leaf Village. Given the ongoing conflict, there were significantly fewer internal patrols than in peacetime, so the infiltrators were not detected until they were almost at the village walls. Based on logic, 200 fighters would hardly be able to storm a fortified village, 
especially if it is defended by several thousand shinobi. However, out of those 200, almost all were Jounin, the last of Iwa's high-level shinobi, which explained the lack of high-level opponents deep inside their territory. And their objective was not to capture Kanoha but to cause as much damage as possible and target the leadership in a suicidal attack. The defender situation was further complicated by the presence of members of the Bakuhatsu Butai among the enemy Jounin, known for their expertise in explosions and destruction of the surrounding area. The attackers did not reach the Hokage, but they managed to blow a section of the wall and damage many houses nearby and along the breach towards the village center. The civilian casualties were around 10,000 dead and an unknown number of wounded. Among the shinobi, there were about 500 dead and approximately half of that number wounded. For just 200, that's a significant result. Fortunately, the main blow missed the clan territories, so there was no need to worry about destroyed homes, although the same couldn't be said for the people. Although I have few friends, there are still some, and I really don't want to visit any more gravestones besides those already erected. However, if I won't have to do that, it doesn't mean that others will escape such a fate. Sum stumbled into my tent in tears that evening. What happened? Even though I asked her the reason for her state, deep down I already knew the answer. Tasan was involved in repelling the attack on the village and was caught in one of the explosions, my teammate managed to say through her sobs. As expected. Sighing, I hugged the Kunoichi and held her close, allowing her to cry it out. I sent a clone to brew a soothing herbal tea, which I had been drinking for the past few days to keep myself together. One of the Jounin had recommended it, swapping his personal stash for a pack of seals. Picking Tsum up, I moved to a futon and settled her on my crossed legs, holding her from behind. Despite growing considerably over the past year, Tsum was still small compared to me and didn't cause any discomfort with her 40 kilograms. As I patted her back and fed the sobbing Kunoichi the aromatic drink, I sighed and thought that playing the role of a tear-absorbing vest would be something I'd do many more times. I want a vacation. Waking up early and quickly preparing breakfast from herbal tea and a ration bar. I slipped out of the tent, leaving behind the now-sleeping Tsum who had only fallen asleep late at night. Squinting at the just-rising sun, I yawned widely behind my mask and shielded my eyes with the brim as I surveyed the camp which was just beginning to wake up. I then slowly made my way towards the headquarters building. It was necessary to address the issue of our team's deployment duration. Although I hadn't thought much about it before, the village's standard policy regarding its forces on the front line is 10 months of combat followed by 3 months of rest. This period can vary slightly depending on Kanoha's needs and the effectiveness of the ongoing military actions. But I know for sure that several people from our reinforcements have already been sent back. Of course, not counting the severely injured and those killed during combat. As far as I remember, shinobi who are sent to the front for the first time usually receive some leniency in their terms, to prevent them from breaking down from the losses and other harsh realities of real war. That's why I decided to visit the commander early this morning, as he is in charge of the camp's personnel rotation. I don't think that with the current number of shinobi and the reduction in the intensity of the conflict between Kanoha and IWA in the past few months, Maido would object to the end of Tsum and Rotaro's deployment. After all, we still have enough contract workers and censors, not to mention Karamaru's injury. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.